Welcome to Folklore on the Rocks. <laughs> Hello, everyone, and welcome to Folklore on the Rocks. I'm Logan. I'm Lindsay. And we have got a great episode in store for you today. Yeah, and we're back. We're not dark again. I <laughs> uh, know, I know. But you know, we're, sorry, we're ready to guys. go full steam forward into 2019, and, and we've got some big things coming. Linz, uh, we're, I'm glad to see you're feeling better. I, I know we've had some concerned fans out there. I'm sure they're glad to hear your you voice, too. So nice. <laughs> Thank you for your well wishes. But yeah, it's been an interesting few weeks. I definitely woke up sick on Christmas morning, and it was just not great. And then it's just been an interesting journey since then. Um, we've had kind of an inversion in our weather here, and that oh, didn't help. Yeah, and yeah. That's something that you, you never quite picture with these high altitude mountain towns is uh, we get all all the smog. It just builds up and stays in these exactly. valleys it's and it so fills bad. it up. Oh, it's like a bowl and yeah. it just stays there. And I also have autoimmune stuff, so I'm more prone to getting sick and then I just get sick for longer. It's just bad. But we're here. We're back. We're recording. We're happy about it. And yeah. I... Cannot wait to hear what you have for me, Logan. <laughs> yeah, this, one, this one's been a really fun one to, to read up on during the holiday break. Uh, while we had some time off, we had some time to look at other projects and and uh, really take our time with this one. And this one's uh, an interesting one. This is the Iraq. I think I'm saying that correctly. The Iraq. We don't know, hopefully. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so it is, uh, it is an Inuit cryptid from the far Arctic regions. This is this is an area we don't go to very often with a lot of our stories. Uh, let's really define where we're going. We're well, let's going... talk about our drink first. Oh, yeah, really... yeah, yeah. But yeah, if we're going to travel anywhere, <laughs> let's get a drink first, of course. Exactly. We just want you guys to know so you can make one and then drink it with us. You yeah. Know? So real quick, our, our drink for this week is called the Iharak, obviously. And it is made... Uh, trying to decide if I want to just read the recipe. I think I'll just do that. So it's half a cup of whipping cream, and then it's two tablespoons plus one separate teaspoon of maple syrup, of course, two ounces of Canadian whiskey. We are using Crown Royal because that's what we can get here in Utah. Yeah, yeah, but it's uh, still a winner. (laughs) But it's tasty. A dash of Angostura bitters, which is optional. If you don't want that, that's fine. Um, and then we add, uh, we've got that in about four to six ounces of really hot, really strong coffee, like good quality coffee. Mm-hmm. So basically what you do is you whisk the whipping cream until you get stiff peaks, just like you would with any other whipped cream. Um, and then you whisk in the two tablespoons of maple syrup, set that to the side keeps pretty well in, in the refrigerator for and covered. You can keep it there for like two days. So you can make it make it in advance if you'd like. But basically you add the whiskey and the maple syrup and the bitters. And when we say maple syrup, that's that extra teaspoon of maple syrup. And and please don't go for the cheap stuff. There is a difference. No, good quality actual <laughs> real maple syrup. You will be doing disgrace to Canada if you use yeah, anything it, otherwise. You would be drinking out of theme if you go for the, the high fructose exactly. corn syrup. Oh, and man, it just wouldn't taste as good, really. Yeah. At all. So, okay. <laughs> so you add your whiskey, you add your teaspoon of maple syrup, and then you add your bitters, if you want those, into a heat-proofed mug. Um, or you can use a glass as long as you warm it up first. And then you're going to pour in your coffee, and you top that with however much maple whipped cream you want and, and that's it, it. and you just drink it a wonderful treat is it oh yeah on a on a cold day and especially if you're going somewhere as chilly as where we're going today uh this is, yes. a, this is a great <laughs> drink for this definitely boozy warm it's snowy out there still for us so we're happy mm-hmm. <laughs> so <laughs> all right um well, so logan tell me about the iraq oh the iraq okay so first of all um like I say, it's an it's an Inuit cryptid, and that is coming from the far, far, far north reaches of North America. Um, now they also do have Inuit people uh, in Greenland and a few over on uh, the European continent as well. It's just one uh, cultural group that's way high north, 
In Alaska, uh, too, right? Yes, in Alaska in the up there. Cool. Um, now, uh, one thing that, well, I, I encountered in my early research on this is, is it Inuit or is it Eskimo? What is Eskimo? Is that, yeah. a, is one a name brand or something like that? I feel like, like it's probably derogatory, right? <laughs> and as it turns out, it is. Uh, I did some research into it. Um, Eskimo, um, it, I forget what language it, it's derived from, but it means the eaters of raw meat. And it was meant to be, you know, kind of a, a derogatory or offensive term, and it kind of has been. And so now the preferred term is Inuit. Okay. Well, and even if that isn't what it meant, like it's that's just what it's taken on, I think, yeah. in, in culture. Like mm-hmm. <laughs> it's not PC, basically. No, nope. <laughs> it's what we're saying. <laughs> but as as we research through history, you have to know what to look for. And so some of our books that we had to read through are, you know, myths of the Eskimos and things like that. Yeah. So really, you have to keep, uh, I guess, an open mind to the complex language of history as we go back. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Linguistically, whatever, maybe it makes sense. But in reality, in social culture, let's just go with the actual name of the Inuit peoples. Yeah, and that exactly. Work. Yeah. Yeah. With, and really... Uh, there, it's a fascinating culture to jump into. We had the chance to read a bunch of myths, not only about the Iraq, but uh, some other myths from this region. And it's a really fascinating world with, mm-hmm. with superhuman characters and trickable gods and, and shapeshifters and animal spirits. It's, it's really kind of a, a cool world. Well, I feel like the, that in a culture where you would have to spend so much time, shelter away from the cold with people mm-hmm. around you because you know their body heat i i feel like that's the perfect breeding ground for stories oh know? yeah and stories about the wild unknown that's literally a foot away from you because mm-hmm. it really is right there yeah one of uh one of my my new favorite youtube ch- uh, channels is actually tear zoo which is uh i'm not sure if you're familiar with it it is tear zoo Ranking animals in a tiered structure. Oh my structure god! Of course. <laughs> as if it is a multiplayer RPG uh, online. Look, and how game. did you not think of that? <laughs> oh man! But the guy does it so well. My hat goes off to him. <laughs> really? He talks about the shark meta or the patch update that went into the ice age and how uh, <laughs> players were re- really upset by that. It's a really great way to look at the history of the whole world. I love that. I definitely need to check that out. Yeah, and and one of the videos that I was watching is he was talking about the polar meta, you know, the the biome of the polar regions, mm-hmm. and he talks about from a from an RPG perspective, it's one of the few places where the terrain is openly hostile to the players. Oh, absolutely, it's like that and the desert, right? Yeah, that that's a great way to just jump right into it. Yeah, it like a desert or deep ocean, it is something that. You can't survive there. You're not supposed to be yeah, there. You, do not you have belong. to fight all the time <laughs> to stay there. Yeah, and it's amazing what people have done to be able to survive, like the cool things and ways they've come up with to survive that that harsh, harsh weather. And it's, it's so a land cool. of ingenuity and in many stories it's so, it's a very brutal land. There's Absolutely. Um, some of these stories, they are, they do not hold back with the just blood, guts, and gore. <laughs> and it's Definitely. like, yeah, and that really adds a fun splash to, you know, some of these stories that we get used to are a little bit more soft around the edges. Yes, definitely. There's actually an audio drama podcast that I've been listening to recently mm-hmm. um, that really puts me in the mindset for this episodes specifically it's called the white vault and it's basically about this this team of researchers that go up to a research station in the arctic and they a whole like a whole bunch of stuff happens basically and i don't want to ruin anything for anyone that's (laughs) gonna listen to it because you should it's so good they're really really good at, at evoking this atmosphere of this bleak stark freezing place that yeah. like unknown threats are are looming everywhere along with the threat of the weather you know you don't know when a polar bear is going to jump out of the blinding white because they're blinding white too 
and suddenly there's teeth and claws that are all right there in your face. Yeah, uh, I'm not sure. Uh, have, you, have you seen any of the AMC series, The Terror? Uh, it's based on Ooh. the book from uh, of the same name from uh, the 1800s somewhere. Clearly, I missed your history over here. <laughs> but anyway, I started listening to the book, and it is it is dreary, and it is grim, and it is the daily accounts of life on a ship as it goes on this expedition northward oh, man. through the ice. And it is, it, it's very, it's very bleak. And even hope is cold and frozen and without real heart to it. I admit I didn't finish the book. It's very long, <laughs> slow, and it bummed me out. So I feel I, that. I feel that. <laughs> I may revisit it uh, after, after this little, little jaunt to the Arctic. It's, did they make a TV show out of it or something? They did. Yes, they did make a TV show out of it. There you um, go. Watch the TV show. <laughs> yeah, and it's pretty cool too. I, I I at first resolved to read the book, but as that didn't happen, maybe I'll check out the show. There you go. Yeah, there's there's <laughs> some really great stuff out there that that really evoke the the feeling of the Arctic adventure that's terrifying and exciting at the same time. Yeah, even before you add any supernatural elements, it is a, a fascinating world of mm-hmm. of just the stark contrast of lifestyles and adaptations to Definitely. really survive up there. Definitely. And then it add into it that it naturally has these kind of uh, mirage in the sky with the northern lights and, and some of, well, I guess it's a little farther north for, for all of those all the time, but it's, it's a place where you can't always trust your eyes. I oh, guess. definitely. Especially since half the time you can't even see what's in front of you. You know, you're in, yeah. in the middle of a blizzard. Who knows what's out there? <laughs> you could take one wrong step and fall off a cliff. You know, yep. <laughs> or through it through ice or something like that, but and there's the very the very real danger of a polar bear. Exactly, which... yeah, totally, and maybe some supernatural aspects. Like, yeah, um, <laughs> like uh, White Vault actually does have some supernatural aspects to it. So if you're interested cool. in that regard, definitely check it out. Sorry, I keep harping on it. It's just so good. I like got drawn super into it and just they're not even a promo with us like i just oh. really really liked it no i kind of think that that's something we should be able to do this is our podcast and we're oh, both definitely. we're both consumers <laughs> of media in different forms so yes. if we see something we like and we You're think gonna it's cool hear about it yeah and especially <laughs> if it pertains to what we're talking about at all <laughs> and then maybe you'll like it too and we can all chat about it it'll be great yeah. But, you know, what, to, just to tie back to the Inuit, one thing that did tie all these disparate tribes together is one key thread in many of their stories is they believe that there are other worlds. Um, they have their snow world and they know that there's somewhere else. And they, 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 it's always talking about not necessarily an underworld or a spirit realm or anything, but they know that there are other places and other people. That's so interesting. I wonder, I wonder, like, did they have their own intrepid explorers that went and found and came back, you know? I would That's put so money on they descended from people who traveled there and stories last a long time That's true. when you tell World them history over and is over impressive. again. Yeah. So when expeditions would come up, they were never shocked and surprised at these white men. What actually was surprising was when you think about it by the time they actually encounter Inuit people, they are starved they are, you know, hungry. They are often sick from from this travel, from this grueling travel northward. Uh, many times they're resorting to cannibalism to survive. They are harrowing journeys that yeah. and, and they don't know how to live in that environment. Yeah, and so when these travelers would come north, they were always just trying to rescue them. They were <laughs> that's the only state white people Aww. ever came in. They're is so this, nice. Sad and broken state. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Just imagine that. Yeah. this guy. Oh man. Speaking of of other lands and and visitors from other realms, um, we'd like to take a moment and just do a promo for one of our fellow podcasters. Yes, we would. All right. So our promo this week is for our good friends, cooking with grief. So this podcast is not about cooking. And it is not about grief, unless you, like, count the grief that they give each other constantly. It's a comedy podcast, and uh, it's got two Chris's, and they, what they do with the show is they basically share a couple of, like, facts or topics with each other each time, and they discuss it, and it's hilarious. 
there is also an like an inordinate amount of Kurt Russell discussion that kind of seems to happen. Awesome. <laughs> so take that with a grain of salt, I guess. If you love him, great, you should. If you don't, you should probably still listen because they make fun of him too. They're really fun guys. It's a hilarious show. And it's really fun to just kind of have on when you're like working or when you're in your car and you're just wanting to feel like you're sitting chatting with somebody or listening to people chat, you know, kind of how you, a lot of you guys do with us, you know, you're sitting listening to a combo with us. Uh, you're a part of it too, you know, and these guys, it's, it's much the same way and they're, they're loads of fun. Um, so we highly recommend them. We are going to play their promo right now. Hi, I'm Chris. And I'm also Chris. And together we do a comedy podcast called Cooking with Grief. Each week we dive into four surprising facts about anything from science to history to the weird world we live in, making jokes about all of it as we go along. You can find us on iTunes or wherever you listen to your podcasts. And you can also find us on Twitter at Cooking with Grief. No G on cooking. So what have you got to lose? Give us a try. Nothing to lose but your sweet, precious time. All right, we're back. I hope you guys give them a listen. Yeah, give them a shot. They sound kind of cool. All right, so what else we got? Okay, so so we were talking about expeditions, and, and that's usually who comes and, and encounters the Inuits. Because of that, a lot of their interactions with the Western world were, were these journals that were sent back. And so because of it, uh, for one, um, a lot of the pronunciations have kind of a uh, a French or Russian twist to them because they were written down through translators as they were sent back from expeditions. That makes sense. Yeah. Um, and so that's why all my research is showing that back to our, our creature, it is Iraq, uh, even though it does have a J in there. Doesn't look like it, but definitely. <laughs> Apparently yeah. that's how it's said. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. And uh, just to find a parallel on there, I did see the word uh Kayak spelled with a J in the middle of it in some of okay, these stories as sense. well, and so you know I got a hunch that that's that's correct. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, so let's actually talk about our creature. Uh, it's yeah. so so first and foremost, the Iraq is a shapeshifter, so Ooh. it can be always any, fun creatures. <laughs> yeah, any real uh, animal that's up there, up in the the Arctic biome and there's a good selection of big scary animals up there to turn into definitely um, but it has kind of a preferred form that is usually described um or maybe even just depicted in artwork this gets a little hazy uh and it's kind of a uh well it's it's kind of a minotaur with a caribou style head Okay, so like top half is a caribou, bottom half a dude. Yeah, and that's or something like that. Yeah, and like it's a, and it, and it's this big primal form that it likes to take sometimes. Because if you can be half caribou, half man, why wouldn't you? You know. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, there's a couple of other reports that the one thing that they hi they have in all of their forms uh, are those red eyes they have glowing red Ooh. eyes that they can't hide so if they turn into a, a snowshoe hair it still has those glowing red eyes if it turns into like a panicula yeah oh yeah. my god <laughs> yes <laughs> guys panicula that's nostalgic there for you right now all our, our probably not all our childhoods but at least mine <laughs> see for me it's definitely did you read it? it for me it's the monty python bunny oh definitely that too yes yeah that that was always manipulated to me too. So, oh, did yeah. you ever read that book? No, no. I, I that was so, one. That, that was one that was on a lot of so other people's good. desks as I was walking around with Jurassic Park. Of, uh, of course, not to be a Lo snob, Logan but and just Michael Crichton. More books tight. needed dinosaurs in them. <laughs> it's fair. It's fair. I mean, it's just a cute little bunny rabbit, but it's also <laughs> Banicula. Like it's so fun. Anyway, sorry. Total tangent there. Um, it's a good book. Go read it. I or if you have shout out to me and we can we can talk about it. I believe you, Lindsay. I think I should read it. I think I have some time. <laughs> you should. Okay, I'll take a look. I just at remember it. it's sucking sucking celery stalks. Yeah, that... <laughs> it's funny. Anyway, sorry. Continue. So he's got those uh, those those red eyes. Red eyes. There's even some some reports that its eyes and mouth are turned sideways, uh, so they open like 
you know, just a, a weird well, that side. Yeah, is uh, creepy as fuck. Yeah, so the weird side that. blink that's often attributed to aliens or reptilians. Uh, yeah, maybe it is a reptilian. Maybe. Oh, too much crossover. Weird, but <laughs> we, we're not a conspiracy show. <laughs> So they have kind of a couple of crazy looks, but the one thing about them is they aren't really a monster, per se. They don't run in and ambush you. Really, it'd make more sense to be afraid of, of a polar bear than being afraid of the Iraq. Um, okay. what, the, what the Iraq will do is when you journey too far north and in a snowstorm, the Iraq will grab you and it will turn you and it will disorient you. And you will never be able to find which way you came from. And it will spend, send you wandering for as long as, well, it wants. Sometimes it'll report that they'll just wander you off forever on the ice. Sometimes they'll send you back home. Sometimes they'll just confuse you and stop you on your way. They are usually a, a warning spirit of, don't go here. Fair enough. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, at the same time, that's definitely a thing that you could do by yourself. <laughs> Just get lost in the Arctic. But I love the the idea of like doom that's coming, you know, like, yeah, you go this way, you're gonna regret it, you know, I actually, uh, in my wanderings through the internet on researching this, uh, there was a Reddit thread in I think either the Pathfinder or D&D subreddit oh, perfect. Uh, that was using the Iraq as a monster. Uh, and it was looking for as you should suggestions for how to use this creature. And I thought, what a fun approach that is uh, from a folklore discussion. Oh, and definitely. and one of the best answers in the in the Reddit discussion was they would use it as a lesser monster for lower level characters as they're early on on an adventure that may end up seeing a Wendigo if they keep going forward. Oh yeah, because. Um, I I don't know if we're going to talk about Wendigos yeah. at some point. Um, well, they are well, really well known. They are really they well. They are creepy as fuck. But in a little like, bit, they are I'm a, scary. Uh, we're going to touch a little bit on them because you can't really oh, talk Iraq without talking Wendigo. Okay, um, perfect. Real Sounds quick, good to me. I, I've actually got a couple of firsthand accounts from Ooh, people. Yeah, tell me. Yeah, these are uh, quite recent. You know, I, as far as I know, these guys are still alive. And this is from a. Uh, discussion they they led with a group of school children talking about the Iraq. Ooh. So, yeah. <laughs> to be in that class. All right. So, our first one is from uh, Herv Paniok. Um, Paniok? I could be wrong in the pronunciation. Probably am. Uh, but this guy knows uh, knows these things a little better than I do. So, let's hear what he has to say. When I was a young man, I was told that I killed an Iraq. I saw a bull caribou and I went after it. My mother and my uncle used to warn me that if I caught a caribou, to look at the appearance of the legs. They used to tell me to do that, and to look at the whiskers and the mouth. They would tell me to look out for that first. If it was like that, I was to cut the throat, or just take the whole head off. After all that, I would be told I caught a bull caribou. We have a tendency to observe caribou, and while I watched it, that caribou would look down on its legs. It wasn't looking sideways to look around. Its head would go under its legs to look around. That's how it ate, too. I don't think it ever saw me. And when I got close to it, I shot it. After I shot it, I put my rifle down and went toward it. After I cooled down from sweating, I went to go see it. The whiskers were moving, and it kept opening its mouth wider. Then I suddenly remembered what I was told, and I just took my rifle and started to run back home. I kept running toward my home, and when I was able to see people, I finally stopped running. So that was interesting. <laughs> yeah, uh, it's it just kind of goes to show that this legend is still alive. This is, this is a, a boogeyman for sure in this world. Well, and knowledge that's that's clearly been passed down and knowledge that is definitely, like, culturally abundant, right? People yeah. know about it. Yeah, this is, a, this, is, this is a culture that tells a lot of stories. And mm -hmm. I think growing up in this world, you would know what an Iraq is. Definitely, definitely. Um, and I think that, like... Maybe maybe it was just like an excuse that he injured a caribou and 
it was not dead and they yeah, scared the shit out of him. Yeah, yeah, it didn't sound all <laughs> but, that supernatural. Um. But hey, you know, better safe than sorry, you know? <laughs> it makes sense. Yeah, his reaction was straight to the Iraq. Uh, that's what mm-hmm. it was. Uh, now, here's another one that is a little bit more specific in what they're looking for to spot in the Iraq. Uh, this one is from a, a guy named uh, Simon Tukumi. All right, Simon. When they want to snatch a human being, the person's scalp starts to peel from right here. When that person fainted, he would be abducted, and the Iraq would bring him home and break his legs because the hunters might run away. After a year of being abducted, the Iraq would take the person back to the area where he was abducted from. Then he would go back to his family. Although he would try to be seen, they wouldn't be able to see him for a long while. I heard this story. It's a true story. It actually happened. They are said to be people like us, but they live inside the land. I've never seen their dwellings myself. It is said that the Ire live over beyond Oamantuak. When people go to that place, they can't see anything. It starts to fog over, and you hear many people whistling. You have to pass it as fast as you can if you get through it until you are able to see clearly. It's hard when you're on a snow machine or dog team. Last year we passed above that particular place where the ERA live by themselves. It was very foggy. They are out there today. If they didn't exist, it wouldn't be like that. It doesn't matter if you believe me or if you don't. It's okay. Okay, that was real creepy. Yeah, now that one... Oof. (laughs) Peeling scalps? Peeling scalps and what they want, and, and it's... Well, and, and like people like um, breaking legs and then taking them back. Like, why why would the Iraq take them in the first place? Yeah, and that's where the story gets a little bit more malicious, uh, where this creature can actually take you if you go someplace dangerous. This is something I think again. It's a it's a story of don't go where you don't belong. Yeah, but it's interesting to me that that they come back. You know, mm-hmm. that's an interesting element to it that makes me think that this creature isn't as malicious as it could be. Like if they just disappeared and never came back, that's one thing. But they leave for that long and then suddenly, hi, here I am again. And my legs were broken, but I'm here. Mm-hmm. You know, like that's that's interesting. That's a, that's a very different element. We don't see a lot of creatures where you're taken for a period of time and then returned. Um, that's it kind of reminds me of Krampus a little bit because that's what he that's, did with kids. I thought the same thing. It's a, I almost think the Iraq is um, almost like a nature spirit that is part of the land that. That would make sense. I think most of like they have a lot of nature spirits in yeah. in that culture. I believe. And its its job is to be the catcher um, to keep yeah. people from going too far. Um, Interesting. But uh, and creepy, yeah, <laughs> <They're> real creepy. <laughs> now, uh, there's there's one more important note to the the Iraq, and it is that it is an Earth spirit. Uh, it is okay. I, what that specifically means. I'm getting a lot of. Uh, it is a very sh- shamanistic kind of culture here, right. um, and it is uh, well, the Iraq is tied to the mountains and to the the well, great stones and. Their um, shamans are shapeshifters, right? Yeah, or at, um, least, or at least from what I am remembering, I could be wrong. I didn't research, so I don't. Yes, know, but. Uh, they their shamans uh, in the stories, at least, can turn into mm-hmm. animals and go and do things. Um, in our uh, in our folklore episode, we got next week. Uh, one of the shamans turns into a fish to go and talk to the goddess of the sea. Oh, that's fun. Yeah, <laughs> so a little preview of what we've got coming. Cool, <laughs> so, I like um, that. So. Uh, yeah, there are they're earth spirits, and they don't really like anything having to do with the, with the open ocean. If you have an anchor or a, a paddle or something mm-hmm. like that, that it, they don't like those things. Uh, they are they're earth spirits. The second thing that is kind of the their kryptonite 
Oh, this this has been my favorite part, Lindsay. Oh, can yeah? I, yeah. I wish podcasts could show how excited I am to talk about this. Guys, he's real excited. Oh, this one. He's is, like he's giddy. This, he's this smiling ear to ear. This was a special surprise when I <laughs> when I read, when I looked this up. This was a special surprise. Okay, now let's take a little journey. Let's to the Super Friends. The 1970s and 80s cartoon show with Batman and Wonder Woman and sometimes right. The Flash, <laughs> uh, Superman, all on the same team. Um, and most of the time, I forget most of what they did, but I really remember, meanwhile, at the Hall of Justice and, you know, of course. and meanwhile, at the Legion of Doom. And the other thing that I really remember from this Hanna-Barbera cartoon is the character of Apache Chief. Now you don't see Apache Chief. He was just kind of, they stopped doing things with him. He sounds like it might be a little racist. He's, but. He, he's, he's inappropriate in today's culture, for sure. And he's definitely insensitive. But he's a hero, and his power is to grow really big. All right. When he says the magic word, Inukchuk. Now... <laughs> Oh, I have said, okay. I personally have said Inuk Chuck at least a thousand times in my life. When it's time I to feel lift. I like I've heard you say that. When, I'm ti- when it's time for me to lift something heavy, I will yell Inuk Chuck because I'm stupid sometimes. But <laughs> I think that's adorable. <laughs> because I live in a cartoon. Uh, and yeah, no, yeah, that, that's true. And this story comes to a head right here. Uh, and Inuk Chuck, that is the antithesis of an Iraq. That's ah. what they don't like. And, and what specifically is an Inukchuk? Yes, it, what is it? It is a cairn of stones. It means the shape of a man. And specifically, these Ooh. cairns are um, kind of triangular and have arm kind of shoulder shapes. Uh, there's a lot of accounts of them being used as waypoints, often being used to mark caches of frozen meat. So it makes sense that they wouldn't like them because they are something that orients you. Mm-hmm. Yes, they. As soon as you find one of those, you can find your way back. Yeah. Uh, um. And there's even an older story. Now this is. And that's an Anukchuk. Yeah, that's an Anukchuk. I love that. <laughs> and find even, your way. There's an even <laughs> older story that I don't know if it's true, but I like to believe that it is. Uh, that is, uh, when they would hunt the caribou, they would set the Anukchuks where they knew the caribou would run, so that they could kind of herd them into specific spots. Mm-hmm. And in many ways, they were supposed to work like a like a scarecrow, that the caribou would run down you know, one way and they see a man shape and run the other way. Ah. Now, I don't know if that's real, but it seems kind of cool. <laughs> well, yeah, no, I guess that would make sense with why they think that the Ihirak are afraid of those. Yeah. You know? Mm-hmm. If caribou are, it, it kind of follows that a half man, half caribou shapeshifter spirit would also be, right? Yeah, this is a world where everything kind of fits together and there's a lot of balance in, and kind of a yin and yang thing going on. Um, and it's been a fun world to explore and, and research. Now, uh, the one thing that uh, is very, very consistent about the Iraq. It has kind of some rules and some ways that you get around it. It has one very consistent thing, and that is after it captures you, you will have memory problems. You will not remember specifically what happened. Uh, so it seems to have some, some kind of lingering psychological effect. Interesting. That is more than just a basic shapeshifter skill set. Does it affect people that you tell? Like if you got back and you told literally every person that you could find what happened. That's actually that's actually according to the myth, uh, the advice they give you. Oh. If you're taken, the first thing you're supposed to do is tell everybody, because so you're going to remind you. Yes, because you're going to forget. <laughs> that's so interesting. I mean, there's something in there about uh, trauma and what it can do to the brain, you mm-hmm. know, and and being lost and terrified in the Arctic tundra. I feel would be traumatic in some way. Yeah. <laughs> um, seeing monsters, definitely also traumatic. So yeah. There's that. 
Yeah, um, that's really interesting. I like that that aspect to it a lot. Yeah, I like they, that there's that threat of you saw this and you're going to forget. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and earlier we talked about how Wendigo is not this, not the same thing. They're very popular, different thing from the same area. Um, because they do look very similar. Yeah, and that's actually because of an artic- artistic mix up. Um, anybody ah. out there, if you want to, if you want to know what uh, an Iraq looks like in artwork, just do a Google image search for Wendigo, and you'll probably <laughs> find it. You'll see those big antlers, <laughs> creepy yeah. eyes. <laughs> yeah, and and the Wendigo people are really mad about this. The Wendigo people are saying, hey, guys, no, this is not what a Wendigo is. This is not an accurate representation of this. But yeah. somehow it has taken off like wildfire in the in the global That's consciousness. So well, yeah, I mean, I mean, the Wendigo shows up in, in a lot of like films and TV shows and mm-hmm. stuff. And, and they, they do look exactly like how we're talking about this creature, you know, like. The giant horns, the yeah, that's body a, of a man. That's a really popular interpretation for the Wendigo. Mm-hmm. And uh, even even so far, I'm again, we're getting off topic on this. And sorry to not well, think I'm, I'm assuming everyone out there is familiar with the Wendigo. If you aren't, Google <laughs> it. Uh, you'll learn something. <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, if a friend podcast of ours, the uh, pop culture mythology podcast that we've talked about before, um, she just did an episode on the Wendigo a little bit ago. So just go listen to hers. <laughs> yeah, there we go. But the Wendigo is part of the same ecosystem as the Iraq. Uh, they, exactly, yeah. yeah. They aren't opposing stories. They don't cancel each other out. It is part of this whole larger world. I kind of wonder if in some regions that the Wendigo does take on this image. You know, I wonder if it just varies by region. Like maybe if in some, it like the two are combined. Very possible. Or, you um, know, I mean, it could be anything really without me actually going out and doing field, re- field research and finding out. But yeah, um, I think that's an interesting possibility. It's one thing in one place and then a combination of a couple of things in another place, which is kind of how, you know, stories work. Mm-hmm. Things... Things combine, things mesh, things get separated, things don't reach one place. With with a territory as large as Canada, especially adding in Greenland and, and Alaska, you mm-hmm. know, that's a really, really large footprint. You know, oh, things yeah. could change everywhere. Oral history is not always super reliable in that things change. It's like the telephone game, you know, Uh, you tell a story, you tell it to the next person, something changes in it, unless they're saying it verbatim. But you know, (laughs) yeah, I don't know if they do that or not. (laughs) But things tend to change and evolve over time. So yeah, well, it could could be one thing, it could be other. I don't know. I don't know. Yeah, Lindsay, okay, okay, what is the coldest you have ever been in your whole life? Oh, man. Probably when we went camping that <laughs> a couple months ago. Really? Just up the canyon? <laughs> <laughs> it was really cold. Um, I had like a multiple layers on, a giant sleeping bag around me. We had a fire and I was frozen. Oh. I don't know if that's really is the coldest I've been, but it's certainly the coldest I have been in a very long time. Understandable. Yeah, that was a chilly it was night. Real cold. <laughs> yeah, we went. We went up one of the canyons. We decided summer wasn't quite over yet. When in fact of it was. Not. It definitely was. <laughs> it definitely was. <laughs> and uh, so much so that uh, the police actually came and asked us to leave the premises. Yeah. Uh, Even though we had made sure that we were allowed to be there, we got before. permits, and yeah. You know. And he was just kind of a dick about it. So yeah. that was really nice. Um, so we packed up in the middle of the, the actual film. We were watching a movie up there. I know, real uh, rebels, generator, menace to society, projector. watching The Shining. <laughs> Logan went back home a few times to get the stuff we needed, it and took we just some doing like, to get that to happen in the woods. We, it was an event, okay? And he just comes along in the middle of us watching The Shining in the woods, and we didn't no, get to sir. finish the movie. <laughs> yeah. Oh well. <laughs> But it was real cold, so it was probably for the best. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, yeah, so that cold times a thousand, and oh, that's man, the kind I, of cold in these stories. Uh, I would die. Where your eyes don't work clearly because there's icicles on top of them. Yeah. And I mean, we, we do live in a place where it's so cold that your eyes hurt. Yeah. yeah but and- I'm sure <laughs> this is far worse, you know, because your eyes would, like, freeze. 
I don't know. It's so scary. Yeah. So this has been a fun little creature to kind of uh, jump into. And and really one of the things that it led me to is it's so connected to really the whole region and the people in that region. I love it. Yeah. It's It seems like it's very much prominent mm-hmm. creature all over that region. And I love that it's that it survived and it's been passed down and we get to know about it because, you know, it, it would be tragic if we weren't informed i guess of something that's so cool this creature is awesome you know yeah, this is something really cool and neat and, uh, and it's so- a good tie to that culture and i love that yeah yeah just to explore some place that boy it seems far away but at the same time boy it some of these right stories there. you can really you can really feel them right in your bones <laughs> yeah definitely I didn't get to ask you, what's the coldest that you've ever been? Well, you know, I've done a lot of, you know, some, some, some ice camping and some backpacking in wintertime. And, and, mm-hmm. uh, but you know, the coldest I've ever been ever in my whole wide life. <laughs> it was an early morning class. I was waiting for the bus while I was at the university. Oh, and, man. And okay. Now, this is desert cold. This is dry angry cold and yes. this is yeah it, it was i admittedly should have dressed warmer but <laughs> <laughs> well it, the thing is with when utah like you will see people wearing shorts and flip-flops until like mid or late december that yeah to be fair we get flash cold it's yeah it'll be yeah, you know, you know, it's 70s not like in, the in a different state, and it's forty in the forties. Yeah, and people are like, "I need a sweater," and we're like, "Oh my gosh, please, no, you don't." It's when it's like twelve degrees outside. We're like, "I guess I'll put pants on." Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, I, I know the whole internet out there is like, "Wow, all that build up for nothing." The bus stop. Yeah, I know, I know. It was <laughs> it was it was cold. It was really cold. Uh, well, it I've, makes it worse because you're. I've waiting. done a lot of other stuff, just not a lot of cold stuff. It's. I'd rather not be cold. Thank you very much. Either that, either that, or I don't get all that cold. I once, I once, uh, I once woke up in a swimming pool that didn't have the heater on, and that felt really cold. But I you wasn't once woke like, up in a swimming pool. Yeah, Logan, I'm, you're not supposed to fall asleep in a swimming pool. I was, I you was, know that, right? I was tired, and there was an air mattress involved. <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay, that makes a little more sense, but still. <laughs> yeah. Oh my gosh. Yeah, but the, so, this whole idea of you were waiting for the bus, right? Yeah. And that means that you don't know when the bus is going to be there. And that makes yeah. it exponentially colder. Like, oh, yeah. for example, I feel like the coldest place in Utah, <laughs> at least to me, mm-hmm. is, I mean, it's probably the top of a mountain somewhere, realistically. But to me is there's a stop um, for our our light rail, our, our public transportation light rail. Mm-hmm. Um, it's the Gallivan Center stop. Oh, yes. And it uh, is between, it's downtown in Salt Lake, and it's between two really, really tall rows of buildings. And the wind comes just straight through it. Yeah. And okay. it is literally always freezing, yeah, even to, in the hottest day in summer. To the rest of the world. Okay. Google Utah Slot Canyon. Okay. Those were carved out by water and wind flowing through very, very short canyons. Okay, when you do that on a big scale, channeling wind straight down into a city, you get just, oh, I heard a great word for it. I heard a great Mm -hmm. word when I was in Australia. A woman goes, it's positively Baltic outside. (laughs) Baltic. (laughs) And I thought, what a fantastic word. I love that. (laughs) Oh, I love it. And I went and I looked it up. And no, it's kind of specific to that that area. So you need it with but a I fair, kind of love that. fair touch of metaphor. But <laughs> I oh, I encountered that one in the it's wild, and I'm happy to Baltic. share it with everyone. <laughs> I love oh, that. that woman, my hat is off to her. <laughs> That's fantastic. I I actually refer to it as the ninth circle of hell, like from Dante's Inferno, when it's the ninth circle where the devil lives. It's, it's fro- a frozen wasteland. Oh yeah, basically. So that's what I call that that stupid stop. And it's usually, it, at least it was for a while, the stop where you would have to get off to switch trains to go up to the university. And it's the like the worst possible place to sit and wait for a train. It's so bad. Yeah, where you just have, where your job is just standing there 
in the cold. Yeah, can't and you go don't anywhere. know when the train's coming. Like it tells you that it's coming in, you know, five minutes or whatever, but who knows if yeah. it actually is. And it's just so cold and it's always shaded and the wind's always blowing. And I'm sure all of your towns have something like that where there's just it's just a cold frozen place to be yeah and sorry everybody i will field our answers before we uh, ask these questions because we've got to come up with some more interesting things if it's just bus stops and waiting for the university <laughs> these are white people problems for sure no it's so true <laughs> but you know at the same time um we've been lucky enough to live in a place where we expect it to get cold and so we, yeah. wear, we wear jackets on the really really cold days so we don't yeah. go outside when but these people in these stories they're stuck up there in the cold every day every day that is their entire life. If I they're if do. they're if they're in a room, it's one person and the cold. That's who else is in that room. So always <laughs> present, definitely. Yeah. And I mean, um, like it, that life that life would be so hard. It'd be you have these ways that you adapt and these cultural expectations of how to survive it. You know that people have cultivated over a long time, but just that constant presence, like you said, and the fear of, you know, hypothermias around every bend, basically. Yeah. And to essentially just never be warm, I would, oh, I can't imagine. I cannot and imagine. But I, <laughs> I, it's so admirable to me. Yeah, how, to really how live well and thrive in such an area. Yeah, it's uh, amazing. And it's a beautiful, beautiful place. Like, the tundra is is gorgeous the life that's there is beautiful oh it's been really um, cool i i went flying over it in google mm -hmm. earth vr and that's a pretty <laughs> insane experience it's, that sounds really cool it's a lot of glacier and a lot of white but it's really a cool adventure uh it's um, not I even cannot... close to as cool as being in person but it's a neat neat try <laughs> no definitely I, I honestly i cannot imagine how blinding it would be on a sunny day Oh, I'm sure it's nuts. So blinding. It's crazy. Um, anyway, uh, <laughs> it's it's a cool culture. It's a cool place. This yep. animal. And, and the Iraq is, is just part of it. Um, <laughs> yeah, that's so uh, that's that's kind of all I've got on the Iraq. I hope we've uh, touched on it. Oh, oh, pluralization. You pluralize it in kind of a French way. So it's Ire uh, for more than one, I think. Fancy. Again, this is all my best I there guess. Are a lot more than one. I wonder if they travel in herds or something. I haven't found a whole lot of. It doesn't sound. They seem like to they be would. a people, but they operate as individuals. Yeah. Um, with this whole, I was curious. Um, with this whole shapeshifter aspect that they have, right? Mm -hmm. Um, I wonder, you know, how far that goes. Like, what else? Since it is a, sh a shapeshifter, does it turn into people in your party, like people in your in the group that you're with or does it turn into other animals or yeah the, you there, know because there is some thought seems... that it can take on a human shape um okay i mean and, it's halfway there <laughs> yeah i guess <laughs> but it will often um uh it's i know I, I get the feeling that it is kind of again a derogatory term uh but mm -hmm. you can say an iraq for someone if, if someone from an inuit tribe is mistrustful of someone from a, a farther north region because okay. they're from too far north. That's apparently something that uh, has some kind of cultural divide. I'm not I really sure it, on it the specific. It does kind of make sense. A um, stranger, you don't expect them to From be. this kind of spooky area. Now... Yeah, when you know you're not supposed to go there. For all I know, things are cool up there. North guys, south guys, <laughs> hope everything's good. Uh, bundle up, it's cold out there. <laughs> yes. <laughs> oh, Logan. Yes. I forgot. We didn't talk about alignment. Oh, alignment. Okay. I think these guys, they like to confuse and they befuddle. So they're definitely uh, chaotic. Kind of. For sure. But, but well, they do you also... Think, like, chaotic uh, neutral, maybe? Chaotic neutral is about right. Because um, they're not chaotic good, obviously, they, but they're they not seem, bad. Yeah, they seem kind of like a very specific kind of fey spirit uh up there that is part of the they, earth and the land. If they didn't and, return people, like if they just killed people, I yeah. think they would be more like chaotic evil, but they don't seem to do that. Yeah, they do whatever know? they want, whenever they want. All the confusion. But they also they also just stay up there. And whether it's just because that's where they like it or because they, they are bound to stay up in the northern regions, that's hard to say. So it's kind of on the border of like 
true neutral and like chaotic neutral. Yeah. I think, Cause I, I think it's actually part of uh, maybe it's, maybe it's some kind of binding to the region that keeps them up there. Otherwise they're like, they're like uh, fenced in or something. Yeah. I mean, otherwise the skill set <laughs> of shapeshifter with memory powers, that's a pretty good monster right there. Why doesn't that take over the world? But I know, I feel, right? I feel like it's kind of stuck up there. <laughs> Uh, so as long as we don't totally trash it, you know, we'll be good with the Iraq. And give us 10 years. I don't know. Yeah, I know, right? <laughs> um, well, this has been a really cool creature. I've enjoyed this immensely. Yeah. It's uh, been a fun one to research. Um, I'm excited to jump into the folklore of this region next week. Definitely, definitely. And if you guys have any comments about it or you're just more interested, you know, um, we'll put stuff on our, our website but you can also reach out to us on Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram about this, and and we'll we'll talk to you. You know, we love talking to fans. In light of that, you can find us on Instagram and Facebook at Folklore on the Rocks. You can find us on Twitter at Where Logan. Folklore Rocks. <laughs> Thank you. It wouldn't be complete if we didn't have you do that. I don't think. <laughs> <laughs> it's my favorite part. Uh, it's so fun. Um, we do have a Patreon. So if you'd like to contribute, help us out a little bit with costs of the equipment that we have and the hosting costs that we have, um, as well as editing, that would be immensely appreciated. Um, Patreon, if you don't know, is a place where you can contribute a, a specific dollar amount a month. Um, we have specific tiers that come with with certain benefits for x dollar amounts um so you can go to our site and look at that if you'd like but we also have a paypal button on our website where you can just make like a one-time donation to help us out if you want um totally up to you regardless we love having you listening that's why we're doing this we we enjoy finding the stuff out and relaying it to you guys it's, yeah it's, i'm so glad that there's somebody else who cares about this stuff. i know right exactly it's, and it's it's really all over the world we have listeners everywhere and we absolutely love it. It blows my mind every time I look at our little map. It's crazy. <laughs> um, so we we also have a merch shop co- that's coming soon. We are very nearly there. Uh, I we're we're kind of just deciding on specific designs that we want to put on and like which products we want for it. So we'll get that decided, and hopefully in the next week or two, we'll actually have that up. So if you want to get some something cool with our logo on it, it's going to be a very real thing coming up here soon. So, the realest of real. The realest thing. You can also get some free stickers from us if you write a review and you send us a screenshot of it. Um, you can send that to admin at Folklore in the Rocks or mail at Folklore in the Rocks. Um, hopefully leave a nice review. We did have our very first one star review, which oh, I think I, is hilarious. Honestly. I saw that. That it's, is it's terrible. Oh, my heart. <laughs> so should I drink less, madam? I, I <laughs> so so basically more? it's it's saying that like who would think that a show about drinking or like people who are drunk or pretending to be drunk would be any fun at all? Who would like that? And I'm like, it's literally in our name. It's, like, yeah. what do you think On The Rocks means? Did you listen? I don't well, know. I, I hope but she finds the podcast that's right for her. I um, hope so, I'm, too. I'm sorry that we didn't meet her maybe, expectations. <laughs> maybe stop uh, trashing other people. <laughs> we are still sorting out our show here, but I don't think a whole lot of her criticism will be taken. Um, yeah. Well, we're going to keep on being folklore on we'll the rocks be, here. We'll be fine, but yeah. we do think it's kind of we do think it's kind of funny. Anyway, but it's still a review, so that does count towards those 100 reviews. Um, and once we hit that, we're going to do that bonus episode for you guys with a listener selected creature. So, um tell your friends, word of mouth is fantastic marketing for us. Um I'm sure if you like cryptids and monsters and folklore, that you know some other people that like cryptids and monsters and folklore. So just let them know about us. Yeah, I was thinking... the good word. uh, Yeah, more than tell your friends, tell your enemies, really. Um, Tell literally everyone you know. We've got a great show (laughs) that you can throw at just about anybody, where it's like, hey, hope you run into an Eeroc tonight. Yeah. And they're they're like, what? (laughs) And they're like, folklore on the rocks, check it out. We we endorse that. Go ahead. Please do. (laughs) 
Um, so we really thank you guys for listening. Thanks for sticking with us. We appreciate it. And yeah, thanks. Um, happy belated New Year. We hope that you tune into us next Sunday. Yeah, let's keep on, you know, just rocking into 2019. Yeah.